and I would like to hand over to Anna Bunny, who is the Head of Education at Orca, who will be running our talk for us today. So over to you, Anna. Thanks, Beck. Thanks, Kieran. Thank you, everyone. And good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you can see, see my screen there with the dolphin on. If, if not, uh, do let me know uh, in the chat box if you can't see it, but hopefully uh, you can. So hi, everyone. My name my name's Anna and um, I work for Orca. I'm the head of education for Orca. So I manage all of our outreach and education work, mainly um, in schools. However, of course, that's been mostly online over the last sort of 18 months or so. Um, I also manage um, the courses that we're running in conjunction with FSC, which we'll talk a little bit more about later on. Um, I manage our wildlife officers too. They are our members of staff that go out on ferries for um, sort of between three and eight months of the year and engage passengers uh, with the wildlife around them on their journey and all other sorts. But that, in, in a nutshell, that's kind of my, my role is all of our inspiring and educating um, areas of work. So... During this talk, in a second, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Orca and the charity and what we do. Um, but of course, we're all here to learn a bit more about these incredible animals here, our whales, dolphins and porpoises, collectively known as cetaceans. And there's around about 90 different species of cetacean that we have um, worldwide. Amazingly, a third of the world's cetaceans can be seen in UK and European waters, which is just absolutely outstanding. A lot of people think you have to go all the way across the other side of the world to see whales and dolphins, but you don't you can see them right here on our doorstep. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the species that we're lucky enough to see right here around the UK a little bit later on. And we'll look at this illustration in a bit more detail later. So kind of a bit of an introduction to Orca. So Orca is one of the UK's leading whale and dolphin conservation charities, and we are dedicated to the long term protection of whales, dolphins and porpoises, again, collectively known as cetaceans and their habitats in UK, European and adjoining waters. But actually now our work does span worldwide. Uh, we're a relatively small charity. There's only six of us members of, of permanent staff and we're based on the south coast of England in Portsmouth and that's where I'm joining you from today. And the charity was formed in 2001, but our volunteers have been out there collecting data since um, 1995. So we have well over a few decades worth of, of data on whales, dolphins and porpoises in our waters. And this data is utilized to assess the conservation status of cetaceans and to highlight vulnerable habitats. And to achieve that, we use platforms of opportunity, which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute, and we use volunteer surveyors because this is very cost effective and gets great results. So we can collect extremely high level scientific data um, on our platforms of opportunity with our fantastic volunteer surveyors. So just to go through a little bit more about Orca's three key program areas. So uh, one of those is inspiring people about the wonders of cetaceans, and that's mainly where my role comes in. So we like to inspire people about how amazing whales and dolphins are and about the wider marine environment as well. And this involves our wildlife officer programmes offshore. So our members of seasonal staff that are based on ferries all throughout the UK and Europe who do uh, presentations, children's activities on board, um, just to highlight really how amazing our waters are for whales and dolphins. And also onshore, we have our schools programs as well. We have loads of school educational uh, resources available now online. During the first lockdown, um, I produced over 20 uh, lessons for students who were at home, you know, uh, parents having to homeschool. So there's a huge resource there on our website. So any of you, are um, home educators or teachers or have have young children then um, let me know and I'll put the link in the in the chat box for you a bit later on but we have a huge resource there which is free for everybody to use so please do forward that information on to anyone um, that you think might be interested and inspiring people from all walks of life is key to our charity's mission as well. The second of our key programme areas is using citizen science and platforms of opportunity, which we'll talk about again in a minute, to create safe places for whales, dolphins and porpoises. And all of this hard work is carried out by our network of volunteers who've trained up with us. They might be marine mammal surveyors or they might be orca ocean watchers. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. 
And um, also through this work, we help to identify critical habitats that need protection. So areas which are well and off in hotspots, which really need protection from human threats. Um, but we also, one of the main threats that we work on is ship strike. So Orca have run really innovative projects with loads of our industry partners because we're lucky enough to work closely with our shipping partners um, to help understand more about how whales um, and ships kind of interact with each other. And unfortunately, just as animals get hit on the land, or, you know, on the roads by cars, the same happens out at sea with especially large whales getting hit by ships. So we're working with, with shipping companies and bridge crews to help um, mitigate this threat and learn more about it as well. And we actually do have a PhD student working um, on that at the moment, and we hope to um, yeah, learn quite a lot from that project. And our third key programme area is to target key decision makers that might be statutory and corporate bodies to bring about policy change um, to improve the conservation for whales, dolphins and porpoises. So Orca sits on a number of scientific advisory panels and we regularly meet with the government and key decision makers to help guide and advise on various cetacean conservation issues. Um, so our volunteers are usually out there, you know, every month of the year, collecting data in real time, and we can report those, um, any findings that we have back to key decision makers to help the conservation of these animals for the future. So we couldn't do all of this amazing work without our teams of volunteer citizen scientists. And I'm sure you've all heard of that phrase, citizen scientists before. So the definition of a citizen scientist is um, anyone, well, it's the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural environment by members of the general public. So you don't have to be a scientist or a marine biologist to get involved with ORCA. Literally anyone from all walks of life can undertake part in our surveys. And historically, most of our surveys were done well, at sea, so on board ferries and cruise ships, as you can see some very diligent volunteers doing here. However, since sort of March last year, unfortunately, we just did a couple of surveys last year before um, COVID hit and the ferries changed to a central travel only um, and all cruises stopped and we um, certainly weren't allowed up on the bridge anymore. Hopefully that won't be the, the case for perhaps later on this year or next year or maybe a few years to come, but we're hoping to get back out to sea. But you know, we really have got to adapt to the times. And one thing that we're really proud of is that we've this year created a whole new program um, so that people can collect data on whales, dolphins and porpoises, wherever they are, wherever that's at sea, on the land. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So just historically, I've mentioned that term platform of opportunity a couple of times. Of course, owning your own ship or boat, um, you know, running it is extremely expensive for so for most of our surveys, we use other people's ships. And one of those ships we use are ferries. And ferries provide an amazing platform, not only for watching wildlife, but for recording wildlife as well. And here are some of the routes that our volunteers have worked on um, so far. And the brilliant thing about a ferry is it pretty much takes the same route every single time or near enough. So that's kind of like our scientific transect line. So it's just like if you walk along um, a woodland path and you record the birds singing or you record the butterflies that you saw and your walk is your transect. It's exactly the same with the ferry. The ferry route is our transect line and we can create, um, we can collect really high level scientific data from these ferries. So as you can see from this map, we have a really good coverage all around the UK, especially the English Channel um, as well and the North Sea. The, these dashed lines here are routes that unfortunately no longer exist, but we do have historical data on those, those routes. So we still have data, but unfortunately these lovely ferries here, which were really fantastic for seeing wildlife, um, don't um, exist anymore. So our, our volunteers collect data from the ferry network. And here we have um, our sightings map. So this is the Orca Marine Wildlife Sightings on board all of our ferry surveys between March and November 2019. Thought I'd show you 2019 because our 2020 map does not look very impressive at all. So each one of these little individual icons is either um, sort of these circles or hexagons or uh, triangles. It's either an individual animal or a group of animals, a pod, and you can see how much wildlife you saw. It's actually quite hard to pick, pick out these sightings on such a sort of zoomed out scale, but if we look down the left hand side here, you can see the key 
there. So we saw a huge diversity of not only whales, dolphins and porpoises, but also uh, seals, sunfish, tuna, basking sharks and turtles as well. Um, and it's just fantastic. You just wouldn't believe the amount of wildlife that you just see from the ferry just when you start looking. It's just phenomenal. And, and of course, seabirds as well. And we also, our volunteers do also work on board cruises as well. We do also now, hopefully in the future, we, we were starting, this programme was really ramping up. And then, of course, when COVID hit, unfortunately, um, stopped most of the, these activities. But we've got lots of plans in the pipeline. So we have volunteers that work on board Saga cruise ships. Um, but we also work with about 10 other cruise partners and we're able to pay our cruise conservationists who are highly trained members of staff that we train um, in a bespoke training course to, to deliver kind of unforgettable experiences for cruise guests. But I just thought that the Saga um, cruise map was just really highlighted the point that the reason that we survey on cruises is that whales and dolphins are highly mobile migratory species. So we, it's really important that we try and monitor them on as wide scale as possible. So the cruises take us um, further afield. So that's really vital in plugging the data gaps between the ferry surveys, especially all these ones um, here all the way around the UK, which are fantastic cruises for wildlife. Um, so the ferry um, routes and the cruise routes together build up a really important um, picture of what's happening for our whales, dolphins and porpoises, not only on a local scale around the UK, but on much more of, sort of an Atlantic scale as well. But here's where this new programme that we're really proud to have developed over uh, the last year, this is where that comes in. So it's called o Orca Ocean Watchers. And what we've done is in partnership with the Field Studies Council is we've developed a brand new online training course and once you've done the training course, you get exclusive access to our app where you can record your, um, your surveys and your whale, dolphin and porpoise sightings wherever you are. So basically anywhere that you can see the sea, whether that's walking along the coastal footpath, um, if you work offshore, um, if you're going on holiday to the coast and you want to sit on a headland and watch, if you're going on holiday via a ferry, if you're commuting backwards and forwards on a ferry, to, to and from the Isle of Wight, like a lot of people do, um, or if you're going on a cruise, you can collect this data using our amazing new app wherever. So yeah, we've developed this online training course, which is all about how to identify the array of different cetaceans you can see in UK and European waters. The app will take you kind of as far down as the Canary Islands and all the way up to the Arctic. So it really does cover the whole of the North Atlantic with the species that we've popped on the app. Um, and yet, once you've completed the uh, training course, you'll have exclusive access to that app and you can use it anywhere that you go. So it's all very exciting. And we just announced that yesterday. So they are uh, for sale now. And I'll talk a little bit more about that right at the end of where you can find out more information. So here we have a little bit of a, a screenshot of what the app looks like. I think you'll agree it looks really exciting and eye catching and we've worked really hard on it. So I know a lot of companies have adapted and developed due to COVID. And I think this is this is what what we've been working very, very hard behind the scenes on. And the reason that we've developed this programme is um, because it's more flexible. So there's more involvement and opportunities for anyone to get involved. Not everyone likes to go out to sea on our surveys. People might not have the time to, to go out to sea on our surveys. Um, this is really flexible. You can just do a half an hour watch when you're on your holidays at the coast, for example, and you know that you've contributed um, to whale and dolphin conservation. The app is extremely easy to use. Um, we do the training course mainly to help you with your cetacean identification skills, and we do walk you through the app as well, but um, it's pretty easy to use. And all in all, it's more data for cetacean conservation. And this data collected by this huge network, hopefully, of citizen scientists can help with a multitude of data uses with really direct conservation benefits. So all of the data collected via the app will help us to have a look at presence absence, so where the animals are, where they aren't, the distribution, the range of species, and particular hotspots for cetaceans, identifying critical habitats that desperately need protection, 
We can also do something called predictive habitat modeling. So where we've mapped all of our sightings, we can start to look at where animals might be seen in uncharted waters due to the depth of the sea, the chlorophyll levels, um, the area of the world that you're in, and all of those things can combine together in our kind of statistical modeling packages to help us look at where these animals might be seen in uncharted waters. And again, highlighting where um, the efforts for where we should help to conserve their habitats. And just as a kind of an example, our data has historically had a huge impact on conservation on a multitude of different levels. So for example, um, on the local level, it's helped to define Scottish marine protected areas. On a national level, all of our data has contributed to inform the special um, area of conservation for harbour porpoises in the North Sea. That's actually the biggest special area of conservation that we have here in the UK. And on an EU level, um, we help Europe achieve their reporting obligations under the Habitats Directive as well, all throughout the data that we've collected uh, historically and what the data collected on the app will go towards. And all of the information on the app will go directly into our ORCA data portal to complement all of the amazing um, data that our volunteers have collected over the last 20 plus years. So hopefully um, I've stressed how easy it is to get involved um, with our new app, which uh, we're really proud of. So our long term data set contains hundreds of thousands of recorded animals and we've surveyed hundreds of thousands of kilometres of European waters as well. And as I've already mentioned, that data is used for assessing conservation status. And we give all of this data free to anybody who wants it, whether that's uh, government bodies, other organisations, researchers, university students, anyone that wants the data, because we believe that good research is essential for conservation effort. But why is this work so important? Well, actually half of all whale, dolphin and porpoise species are considered data deficient in the IUCN classification. And what that means is that we don't really know enough about them to know if their population levels are increasing or decreasing, if their distributions are changing and which species are sort of declining faster than others. So that's why our work is of paramount importance in not only reporting on species populations, but also identifying critical habitats as well. So in a real nutshell, that's kind of what ORCA's work and an introduction to that ORCA Ocean Watchers program, which I just thought some of you might be interested in. So here we go back to this wonderful image here. This is by an American um, illustrator called Yuko Gorta. Unfortunately, you can't buy this poster um, unless you want to pay about 50 pounds um, import fees from America, but really beautiful images, which is really up to date. And it shows the around about 90 different species of cetaceans in the world today. And we say around about 90 because that number does go up and down. Unfortunately, it does go down as species become extinct. The last species of cetacean to become extinct was the Yangtze River dolphin in 2007. Um, and there's some species which we'll talk about a bit later on that are on the brink of extinction as well. But also excitingly, some species are discovered and it's mainly these very strange looking creatures in the bottom right hand corner here. These are the beaked whales, they're toothed whales. They're extremely elusive, deep diving animals. They hardly spend any time at the surface and we don't really know much about them. And there's still quite a few species of beaked whale out there that haven't been uh, properly described yet because they've only been sighted once or sometimes just their um, echolocation calls have been picked up on a hydrophone and we don't know what species the sounds belong to. So all very interesting stuff that there's still whales out there yet to be discovered. And as I mentioned earlier, about a third of the world's cetacean species can be seen in UK and European waters. So around about 30 species of cetacean have been recorded um, in UK and European waters. These might be regular visitors or they, you know, that live here year round or might visit us every year on their migration, or there might be quite rare visitors as well. For example, uh, the bowhead whale is ticked. That's a very high Arctic species, but there was a sighting of uh, one in Cornwall just a few years ago. So rare visitors as well as um, ones that live here year round. So cetaceans, as we already know, are whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and they're all marine mammals. So they breathe air, they give birth to live young, the young suckle milk from their mothers as well. Uh, they are warm-blooded. They also do have hair. 
some species of whale keep their hair for all their lives, but usually um, sort of dolphins, they'll lose their whiskers kind of uh, in the first few months of their life. And also their, their tails move up and down because they have a backbone very similar to us as mammals as well. And cetaceans can be divided into two groups. So we have the toothed whales, that includes all of the porpoises, all the oceanic dolphins, the river dolphins, the sperm whale and the beaked whale. And you've got some examples there, for example, the harbour porpoise, bottlenose dolphin, orca, pilot whale, sperm whale and the Cuvier's beaked whale, for example. And then we also have the baleen whales as well that look very different to the toothed whales. And these are the rockwell whales, right whales, oops, um, and pygmy right whales, for example, the blue whale, humpback whale, the, the great whales, people call them those really um, incredible animals. And here, here are kind of the most obvious differences to distinguish them both. Th these pictures aren't to scale, but just to show you. So first of all is the, is the dorsal fin. So with dolphins and porpoises, their dorsal fin is very central on their body. And the dorsal fin is quite large in comparison to the size of the body. Whereas with our baleen whales, that dorsal fin is very small and it's two thirds of the way along their back. Baleen whales have two blowholes, toothed whales only have one blowhole and the way they feed is completely different as well. So tooth cetaceans have, uh, well, some of them don't have a full complement of teeth that they would have done during their evolution. But here we can see a bottlenose dolphin, which does have about sort of 90 to 100 sharp cone shaped teeth which it uses for catching prey individually and swallowing that whole. And their favourite food includes squid, large fish, small fish, uh, jellyfish, um, for example, sort of cod, salmon, that kind of thing. And all of the toothed whales use something called echolocation. Um, so I'm sure you've all heard of echolocation sounds before. But what they do is they force air from their nasal sacs through phonic lips. So actually they produce these clicking and squeaking sounds in their blowhole, in their nostrils. And these bounce off the front of the skull and then are magnified and directed forwards through the melon, which is this kind of yellow organ you can see here in the cross, cross section of this dolphin's head here. And this is what gives most tooth cetaceans the uh, appearance of a very bulbous forehead. So just this big fatty organ, which kind of acts like a, a lens and it concentrates the sound, which then goes out into the environment. Um, and when these sounds hit uh, an object, that might be a fish or a rock, the, um, the echo of the sound bounces back to this organ here in the dolphin's lower jaw, which then sends signals to the dolphin's brain about how far away the object is, the size, the shape and its density as well. So some species send out dozens and dozens of clicks um, per second. Some species, it's about 80 clicks per second they can send out. And they move their heads side to side, sending out all of these clicks to build up a really accurate picture of what's around them. And sound is their primary sense. So most whales and dolphins do have quite good eyesight. Although, of course, when you go a few metres down into the water, you lose the sunlight and it gets quite murky as well. So they can't really use their eyesight in, in deeper waters, but uh, they use sound instead, which is extremely effective um, for hunting, for communicating with their prey and for navigation as well. And the way the baleen whales feed is very, very different. So the baleen whales or Mr. Seats uh, do not have teeth and therefore they have a very different feeding strategy. They have um, fringed plates of baleen. So baleen is made out of keratin, so the same material as our hair and fingernails. And as the whale takes in huge mouthfuls of water containing uh, small fish, plankton and krill, the baleen uh, traps and filters the prey um, as the water is forced out of their mouth. So I'll just describe how they do that. So here we have um, a humpback whale lunge feeding. You can see the baleen plates here look like a really kind of thick brush that hangs from their top jaw. So what they do is, well, some species of whale are also called, or baleen whale are called rorquals. Not all baleen whales are rorquals, but um, all of the frequent visitors 
of whale species that we have in the UK are rorquals. Um, and what, what being a rorqual means is they have pleats, muscular pleats, which extend from the bottom of their sort of lower lip all the way down to their navel. And when the whale opens up its mouth, these muscular pleats relax and expand and open up kind of like a big bucket to, um, to allow the whale to scoop up hundreds of gallons worth of prey all in one go. So it opens its mouth, it lets all the water in the play, uh, prey rush in, and then the whale will close its mouth and it uses its tongue then to squeeze all the prey out of its mouth. And that baleen acts like a giant sieve. So the baleen has got small gaps in it um, that allow the water to flow out, but the gaps in the baleen aren't large enough to allow any of the food to escape. So the whale squeezes all the water out of its mouth by using its tongue and by contracting those rockwool pleats. And then once the whale has squeezed all the water out of its mouth, it runs its tongue along the inside um, of the baleen, rolls the prey into a ball and swallows it whole. So it's an extremely effective feeding strategy for these huge baleen whales to feed on lots and lots of tiny prey all in one go. So as you can see, the toothed whales and the baleen whales, they feed very differently and therefore look very different from one another as well. Right, to keep you on your toes, I've got a poll for you now. So do you know what is the closest living land relative of cetaceans? So hopefully you can see the poll um, on the screen now. So we have four options, uh, wolf, elephant, hippopotamus or otter. What do we think? This poll is completely anonymous, so do not worry about getting the answer wrong if you don't quite know. Um, it's always better just to have a guess um, and yeah, see what you think. I can see them flooding in. Yeah, I can't see your, um, who's, um, who's guessed on which one, but I can just see the number of how many people. So we, we have a clear winner at the moment. I'll just give it a few more seconds. Anyone else wants to have a go? So 46% of you are saying elephant and 42% of you are saying hippopotamus. I'm gonna end the poll there. And I'll give you a clue. It's actually the hippo. <laughs> so the, um, the hippopotamus um, and whales shared a common ancestor that existed roughly around 15 million years, years ago. It's pretty amazing that, isn't it? Um, and also what I find absolutely amazing is that whales evolved from animals that looked like small wolf-like creatures. Um, and these animals started to forage in the sea, developing webbed feet, a thicker, more muscular tail. And over time, as they slowly but surely became exclusively sea animals, sea or water animals in freshwater as well, they completely lost their back legs because they developed this very powerful tail fluke, uh, sort of peduncle and tail flute, which moves up and down to, um, to propel themselves through the water very efficiently and, and easily. They developed a thick layer of fat around their body to help keep them warm in the sometimes cold water. Their front legs turned into the pectoral fins that we see today. And if you look at the, the cross section of a pectoral fin, the, um, it looks like fingers. So you can see that how that they've developed from paws. They had a, a very elongated snout to help them feed on large fish. The blowhole moved, so their nose from the end of the face, like where you would see a dog today, all up to the top of their head to form their blowhole and um, loads of other adaptations as well. I kind of lost my trail of thought there. And here we have um, some evidence of whale evolution, which is mostly through fossil evidence. Well, it is all through fossil evidence. But in modern whales today, this is a bowhead whale skeleton. So here you can see what I was talking about is that the pectoral fin uh, bone structure looks like fingers, hands. So it would have developed from, from sort of a paw-like uh, limb. But here we can see actually residual hip bones. So that's how we know that whales used to have four legs because that's where their the hips would have been there. We also know that sort of 47 million years ago, the nostrils were at the front of the skull. And over millions of years, it changed kind of to the middle of the head and up to the top where we know that their nostrils are there, what we call their blowhole today. So just think that's absolutely fascinating. Okay, I've got another poll for you, just in case anyone's uh, falling asleep. Anyone tell me 
what the largest species of whale is. Again, we have four options. We have the humpback whale, the blue whale, the fin whale, or the North Atlantic right whale. What do we reckon? Oh, the, the guesses are flooding in. Anyone else want to have a guess? There is a very clear winner. Give you a few more seconds. I think I'll end that one there. So we have a very clear winner. Yes, 96% of you correct, uh, correctly guessed the blue whale. So the blue whale is the largest species of whale. And actually it's the largest species of animal that's ever lived on our planet. It's larger than any of the sharks or dinosaurs. It can grow up to 33 meters long. That's the same size as not one, not two, but three double-decker buses. You could balance an African elephant. That's our largest land mammal on its tongue. Its heart is the same size as a small car. There you can see a picture of a model of a blue whale's heart. And the blue whale doesn't eat burgers, but if the blue whale did eat burgers, they'd have to eat 1,588 burgers a day to survive. Of course, they don't eat burgers. They eat one of the smallest uh, ocean creatures, these krill, which are tiny shrimp-like creatures. And the blue whale wouldn't eat them individually. Um, it opens its mouth and engulfs huge swarms of millions of krill all in one go. So the blue whale is the largest animal that's ever lived on our planet that we know of. And the amazing thing is that it's still alive, swimming around in our oceans as we are speaking right now. Okay, another poll for you. This is the last one, I promise. But does anyone know what the largest species of dolphin is? We have four options, uh, the bottlenose dolphin, the killer whale, the Risso's dolphin, or the pilot whale. Again, the votes are flooding in for this one. I'll give you sort of about 10 more seconds to have a little bit of a guess. Okay, has everyone guessed who would like to guess? So there is another clear winner. 81% of you did get the correct answer. Sometimes this tricks people, catches them out, but the largest species of dolphin is the killer whale or the orca. Um, it's a dolphin because it has teeth and it's got that centrally placed large dorsal fin here. So meaning it's a member of the dolphin family. It's called a killer whale because it will kill and eat uh, species of large whale, which is gray whales, humpback whales, and even blue whales. They're a pretty um, cosmopolitan species. They can be seen in pretty much every ocean all around the world. And their population numbers are doing quite well with 50,000 killer whales uh, as their worldwide estimated population. They can grow up to about 10 meters long. So that's the largest species of dolphin. And that dorsal fin alone can be as tall as a very tall person. In males, the dorsal fin can be up to uh, two meters high. Uh, the killer whale or the orca is the top predator of the, of the ocean. Um, and there's actually different pods, different ecotypes of orcas all the way around the world that not only speak different dialects, but they also specialize in feeding on different prey as well. So just a few examples here. Um, the orcas in uh, that forage and feed around South Africa are known to eat great white sharks. The orcas around uh, Norway are known to eat herring. In New Zealand, the orcas specialize in feeding on stingray. Uh, quite a lot of uh, Orcas specialise in feeding on other marine mammals, whether that's seals or whales and porpoises as well. So they're extremely intelligent animals. Because they hunt in packs, they can feed on animals much larger than themselves. And they have loads of different amazing feeding um, techniques. Could do a whole presentation on this, but I will, I will leave that there for you guys to go do your own research uh, if you would like to. And then we go to the smallest cetacean, which is this tiny porpoise called the vaquita. It's only about 1.2 to 1.4 meters long, only lives in this tiny bit of the Sea of Cortez um, in, in Mexico. Unfortunately, there's only 10 of them left. They're very, very near extinction. And that's because unfortunately, uh, due to bycatch, so when they get caught in fishermen's nets, um, 
And as they're quite a small species, they can't hold their breath very long. They get caught in these nets and they can't get up to the surface to breathe and they end up um, suffocating there. And unfortunately, in this area of the world, there's a lot of illegal fisheries for a type of fish called the totoaba, which has an extremely high market value on the black market in China. So their swim bladder can reach up to hundreds of thousands of dollars just for one uh, fish. That fish is also on the endangered, endangered, critically endangered list as well. So you might hear quite a lot about the vaquita in the news because um, it's very, very near extinction. So I just thought I'd talk a little bit more about some of the species that we are lucky enough to see in the UK. And the smallest but most common species of cetacean that we see is the lovely harbour porpoise. And it's actually the only species of porpoise that we see um, in UK and European waters. Seven species of porpoise worldwide, but the harbour porpoise is the only one that we see. Very often sighted from land, it likes coastal waters, but you do need a very nice calm day to spot it because they're quite shy, quite elusive. Um, once you get a few kind of white caps on tops of the waves, it gets very, very hard to spot them. But they go up to about 1.7 meters long. So the smallest but most common species of cetacean. Bottlenose dolphins can be seen all around the world, but the bottlenose dolphins that we get here in the UK are actually the largest in the world. And that's due to the cold water and their salmon diet as well. Um, so great places to spot bottlenose dolphins are sort of Cardigan Bay in West Wales and also the Moray Firth on the east coast of Scotland too. So four metres long, it's pretty big. Big bulky dolphins, all grey in colour. We're also lucky to have some visitors, such as the humpback whale. So I'm only going to go through literally a couple of, of these species, um, not going to go through every species that we see in the UK. You'll have to do the Ocean Watchers course to, to learn all about that. But um, the humpback whale is my favourite species of cetacean. Um, I think they're, they're fascinating, they're beautiful, and um, I love their active and energetic behaviours as well. So they're known for their kind of breaching behaviors, as you can see here. They've got these beautiful long white pectoral fins. And these kind of tubercles you can see on its, on its head, they're actually hair follicles, and they can be about the same size as a golf ball. There's a very, very characteristic, that of the humpback whale. They lift their tail fluke up when they're about to do a deep dive. And there's just another lovely picture of a humpback whale breach I'd put in. Um, and we know quite a lot about humpback whales generally, and that's due to an amazing non-invasive surveying technique called photographic identification. So the underside of a humpback whale's tail fluke is like an individual fingerprint. It's, as you can see here, there's three different animals, not only do we know they're humpback whales, but you could almost name them, give them names or numbers. And people have given humpback whales around the world names and numbers to help identify them and help remember, remember their names. And catalogues have been built up all around the world of the animals that, that visit the waters where these catalogues are. And people can share those and find out way more about them. And that's how we know so much about the fascinating humpback whale migration. So these blue dots here are um, feeding grounds. These orange dots are breeding grounds. So these animals travel to um, tropical waters to breed and have their young. These are nice nurturing warm waters. Then they'll make mammoth migrations um, up to cooler waters, which are way more productive. So they'll just gorge themselves on food in those areas. It's worth traveling all that way just to feed. And um, we know that some humpback whales visit us in Scotland that have come all the way from the Caribbean due to photo identification as well. The next species uh, I just wanted to quickly talk about is the sperm whale. This is the largest species of toothed whale. Each tooth is about the same size and weight as a brick, and they have about they have a pair of 25 um, teeth on their lower jaw. They haven't got any teeth on their top jaw. They just have big holes in their gums that the teeth kind of slopped into. But they're huge, going up to 20 meters long. They're not really a resident species that we see in the UK. It's mainly the males that come and, and migrate. Um, the females stay in tropical waters and the males migrate because there's less competition for food. Um, but we see these in deeper waters. So in the UK, we are on the continental shelf, but you haven't got to go 
very far out to get to the continental shelf edge. And that's where the water drops off from sort of 200 meters to over 4,000 meters deep. It's like a big underwater cliff. And that's where we see the sperm whales because there's lots of their favorite food here, which is the squid. And uh, they have these battles with the giant squid. No one's ever actually seen that, but we know that that's their favorite prey because we found remains of giant squid beaks in sperm whale stomachs. And because of the scars around the sperm whale's head they get from these battles. And because the sperm whale is a toothed whale, it uses its echolocation. And amazingly, they can echolocate louder than a rocket launch at 230 decibels. And the last species I just wanted to highlight is our amazing Cuvier's beaked whale. And we're very fond of this um, very strange looking creature here at Orca because as part of our work on the Brittany ferries vessels which sail from the south coast of England, so Portsmouth or Plymouth, down to, to Spain, Santander or Bilbao, we've identified a real hot spot for this strange um, whale. Some people call it the goose-faced whale because it kind of looks like it's got a, a goose face if you can see that, but they're absolutely amazing. So let's have a look at how deep the Cuvier's beaked whale can dive. And it's actually the deepest and longest diving animal of all, well, oh, sorry, deepest and longest diving uh, marine mammal on the planet. So here we, uh, so we've got 200 meters, firstly, so that's how deep kind of most dolphins dive. And the deepest free diver is 214 meters deep. Go down a bit further. This is uh, Toffee, the, Bottlenose dolphin, who in 1965 was trained by the Navy for military exercises, and that individual could dive to 300 meters. Deepest scuba diver, 332, I think that was. Submarines roam about 500 meters deep. And even though the blue whale doesn't often dive to that uh, deep, that's how deep we know that they, they can dive, 504 meters there. Some of the dolphins, like the pilot whale, that are nocturnal and feed on squid will forage at 1,000 metres deep. Same with the leatherback turtle at 1,280 metres. You see, we've completely lost the sunlight now. And then we get to the sperm whale, who can dive to 2,250 metres. And for a long time, it was thought that the elephant seal was the deepest diving marine mammal. Until, I think it was 2017, a Cuvier's beaked whale broke the record it dived to 2,992 metres deep and held its breath for over two and a half hours. So the QVA's beaked whale generally performs um, sort of three, three times as many shallow dives as deep ones. But they spend a similar proportion of their time diving deep and diving shallow as well. Only 14% of their time is spent at the surface of the water. And that's generally actually at night. And that's why we don't really know much about these species. Incredible. So even though hopefully you now know that cetaceans are uh, intelligent and beautiful and really fascinating as well, there's a huge variety of different threats that they face. And I'm just going to very, very briefly touch on some of these now. So we've got fisheries, um, bycatch, which is when animals that aren't the target species get caught up in fishing nets. We've got overfishing as well. So taking out too much fish from the ocean for human consumption, not leaving enough for wildlife. <clears throat> Unfortunately, three countries still conduct commercial whaling, as Japan, Iceland and Norway, despite the moratorium on whaling. That's the global ban by the International Whaling Commission that came into effect in 1986. There are huge welfare concerns regarding whaling, with animals suffering significantly and prolonged, uh, prolonged um, periods from time and distress as well. Habitat destruction and modification. So as I mentioned, first of all, uh, in the talk, the last species to become extinct was the Yangtze River dolphin um, in 2007. It was a huge combination of threats that led to the extinction of this species. But one of the main ones was building the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River, which completely altered the river's ecosystem, just as, a, as an example there. We have pollution, so chemical pollution, noise pollution, and physical pollution, such as marine litter climate change and uh, disturbance. So direct harassment, ship strike and live capture from ocean areas. Again, I've really just touched on those very, very briefly, but it's just to highlight there are a combination of threats that, that our cetaceans are facing today. We have just released our most recent, the State of European Cetaceans reports. They can all be read and downloaded free on our website. 
So, and we do go into way more depth about these threats. So if you're interested, uh, please do have a look at those. They're really accessible reports. Um, you don't have to be a scientist to read them. Um, and they're really, really interesting as well. So do have a look at those. So I thought I'd just finish off with how you can get involved. Well, first of all, you can train to become an Orca Ocean Watcher. All of the information is on our website and the Field Studies Council website as well. And that's to, once you do the training, you can get the app and you can survey for whales and dolphins wherever you are, as long as you can see the sea. Um, you also might want to train up to become one of our Orca Marine Mammal Surveyors. Those are our training courses that we run in the winter months to train up citizen scientists to um, go out on the ferries and then the cruise ships to collect data um, from that as a platform. And we do also have two online um, Field Studies Council ecology and conservation courses that ORCA have developed with the Field Studies Council. We have the Discovering Marine Mammals course and the Conservation of Marine Mammals courses. So they're beginner level courses that are kind of an introduction to marine mammals, particularly British marine mammals, and the conservation of those animals as well. But all of the information is on our website. Thank you for listening. I know I've gone way over my time. I get a bit carried away. Um, and thanks for um, Beck for putting the, the links in the, in the chat box. That's great. I will stop sharing my screen now. And does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? Let me have a look at the, the chat box first of all. We just had one question in the chat box um, and it was just someone asking, how old do you have to be to get involved with ocean watchers or orca as a whole? So with our marine mammal surveyors, you do need to be um, 18 or over. That's just because you go on the ferries and the they have an age limit for people to go up on the bridge. So it's 18 and over. For orca ocean watchers, um, for really young people, the um, if their parents want to train up and go with them, that's absolutely fine. But we have put a, a 16 um, years old and over for the Orca Ocean Watchers course. If that answers your question. And does anyone have any questions? They can raise their virtual hand or mute yourself. Come and ask Anna a question if you have anything you would like to ask. If you can't think of anything now and you have any questions about the courses, feel free to, to email us. I'll put our email. Uh, in the in the chat box i've got a question anna yes if we can all do one thing to help our whales and dolphins if you could get everybody to do one thing what would it be that's a great question but it's quite a hard one to answer um i i like to say about trying to reduce the amount of plastic that you're consuming because it's something that everyone can do in their everyday lives that does you can directly see the impact one of the main threats that face cetaceans is, is bycatch, so getting caught, caught in nets. Um, hundreds of thousands of marine mammals every year get caught in, in fishing nets. So it's trying to buy more sustainable seafood, uh, local seafood if you can, caught by sort of uh, pole and line fishing rather than huge mass fisheries. But a lot of schools ask me that question of what they can do. And actually a, a single school can make so much difference in terms of their plastic footprint. So particularly just refusing plastic, refusing to buy any items that have plastic and also trying to uh, reuse and recycle um, as much as possible. As so well. complain to your local supermarket when they're packaging up four apples together. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. Brilliant. And actually some of the schools I've worked with, they have written to their local supermarket and they have actually received responses and they can see how that, that's changed. So uh, it's people power. They that those those children have made a real difference to their local community within that respect, which is great. Mm -hmm. Charles, you have a question. You've got your hand up. It was really uh, it was sort of related to you know what what could we do? I just was I suppose mildly an advert. There's a great um, uh, course that's run across the UK called the Wise Course, which is designed for um, it's actually designed for commercial folk um, that that do guide um, that, that do guiding and and uh, and so on at sea. You know, going on 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 cetacean viewing and whatever. First of all, I'd encourage people 
to, if they're looking to 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 go on on you know to to go to sea with with a uh, with a um a an operator to uh, to look out for that because it's a it's a it's a good course that makes sure that the that you know that disturb you know any time we interact with with these animals we, we are going to be disturbing them but but it 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 reduces disturbance to a minimum and also as I've done I'm not a commercial um uh, operator but I you know I take family out a lot and in the Firth of Clyde we've got a lot of cetaceans lots of bottlenose dolphins at the moment which is great and I paid to go on the course myself because I just didn't feel comfortable about being around uh, marine uh, uh, mammals uh, you know and, and and the disturbance and it's a great course run by you know a number of organizations I don't know if you guys do it but your colleagues up in the Hebridean well the Dolphin Trust certainly run it as well and it's run across the place and I, I spent a day doing it just before lockdown last year and thought it was a really impressive course but if I could just sorry if I could just encourage yeah, people no, that's, to go to that's do it great. To, to use wise they're great and actually, yeah and actually Charles that raises a really good point you know with everyone doing staycations this year and going to the coast as much as possible it, it's going to be super busy and there is a, a big campaign out at the moment that the Orca have signed up to along with other organizations such as the, you know, the British Divers Marine Life Rescue to, to give animals space not just cetaceans but seals as well who fall out on the shore really important to keep dogs under control you might have seen like that, uh, that horrific uh, report that dog off the lead that attacked the seal on the Thames um, and, and that happens every year that one just gate had a lot of a lot of media attention but um, it's a really important point you know we are all staying here for our holidays going down to the coast maybe hiring jet skis and things and that and that does raise a, a really important point point. and um, I think uh, recently on, on all of our social media pages we've we've been encouraging people to look at the guidelines for watching for marine mammals so please can do, I do out. Can, can I do one more advert since you raised of course, it of course also in BDLM BDMLR we're back to training uh, medics again um so oh, we're doing training again and and that's also a great thing people can do if they want to be involved and you know uh, it, it's it, it again it's a super course and is reliant entirely on volunteers so therefore you you you, you spurred me to do a different advert I'll shut up now no that's fine um I'm also a marine mammal medic as well so what I'm going to do in the chat box is just write down uh British Divers Marine Life Rescue for you guys to research because Everyone said BDMLR and no, no one really knows, knows what it means a lot of the time, but it's the British Divers Marine Life Rescue. And that's the training you can do if you ever see any uh, marine mammals um, in distress, um, alive. Of course, if you find one dead, it's a different organisation. But if you ever see any whales, dolphins or porpoises alive on the on the coastline, those are the guys to, to contact. Or maybe a seal pup that's looking a bit malnourished. Um, that's the thing to look. Sorry if you can hear my puppy. She's just woken up, which I think is fantastic timing. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to get away with the whole hour. <laughs> All good. Anyone else got any other questions? Might need a bit of time to mull everything over maybe, but please don't hesitate to contact us if anyone has any questions. Yeah, and in our follow-up email, which should be coming um, hopefully by the end of this week, we'll include that email there. So if you do have any questions for Anna, you can send them over.